Hello, and thanks for tuning into this video. My name is Richard, and I run a company called Muddy York Walking Tours. I offer many different historical presentations and walking tours of Toronto. I put together this biography of a man named Albert Jackson as part of a series of talks I prepared on notable people who lived in Toronto. Albert Jackson faced a lot of social obstacles to become Canada's first black postal carrier. This presentation explores his story, uh, but also includes a lot of information about his immediate family. I hope that you enjoy watching it. Please note that uh, you can leave any questions or comments in the uh, section below, uh, and also uh, find my website, my email address, my Instagram account, and my Facebook page uh, below as well. In my presentation today, I had originally planned to talk mostly about Albert Jackson. In 1882, he became the first black letter carrier to work for the Royal Mail in Canada. But as I kept on putting my research together, I found out more and more about his immediate family, uh, and especially his mother, Anne Maria Jackson. She was a single mother who fled the United States in 1858 and brought her children to Toronto. So as you'll see, I've modified my presentation somewhat, and it's become more about the Jackson family in general. I hope that by talking about the difficulties that Albert Jackson and the rest of his family faced, we can uncover some of the harder truths behind our city's history. But I also want to talk about some of the successes that the Jackson family had. Albert Jackson first arrived uh, here in Canada with his family in 1858. He was only a toddler, about one year old. The family eventually found their way to Toronto, where Jackson went to school, got an education, and entered government service. But before I really get into telling you all about that, I'd like to set the scene by describing what life was like for Toronto's early Black community in the couple of decades before Albert Jackson got here. A law called the Slavery Abolition Act came into effect on August the 1st, 1834. This act officially abolished slavery anywhere within the British Empire. All the countries shown in red on the map. These included British North America and, of course, the city of Toronto. Slavery was now legal in every single Canadian colony. As soon as the British government outlawed slavery in 1834, thousands and thousands of people who were still enslaved down in the United States, where slavery was still legal, came north to freedom in Canada. These freedom seekers traveled by night, hid out in safe houses, and were aided by abolitionists, both black and white. Their route involved a variety of secret networks called the Underground Railroad at least until they arrived here in Canada, where it was often called the Freedom Trail. Somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 Black refugees came to Canada just in the 10 years between 1850 and 1860 alone. We'll never know for sure how many came. They were escaping recapture and even death, so secrecy and anonymity were important parts of their flight. But we do know a little bit more about some of the more prolific Black people who were living in Toronto in the years before Albert Jackson and the rest of his family got here. Thornton Blackburn and his wife Lucy Blackburn escaped from slavery in the United States and were reunited here in Toronto in 1834. That was the same year that the Slavery uh, Abolition Act came into effect. But 1834 was also the year that Toronto was incorporated as a city. The Blackburns found a brand new start in the new city, and they eventually prospered. This is a painting that an artist named John Gillespie made of King Street East, looking west from Jarvis Street in 1844. At first glance, the painting gives us a cursory sense of Toronto's character, but if we take a closer look at the middle of the painting, we see a yellow coach making its way westbound down King Street. In 1837, Thornton Blackburn started Toronto's very first taxi service. He started out with a single horse-drawn carriage that could hold up to four passengers. In 
Thornton Blackburn painted his taxi cab yellow and red. For many years, this color scheme was adopted by vehicles used by the Toronto Transit Commission, or TTC, as a salute to Thornton Blackburn's innovative transportation business. The Blackburns lived in a house on Eastern Avenue, west of Sumac Street, for half a century. Their home is no longer standing, but at least this plaque commemorates their legacy. The plaque is at 19 Sackville Street, a couple of blocks east of King and Parliament Streets. It talks about how well-respected the Blackburns were and how they made a lot of contributions to their community. A man named Wilson Ruffin Abbott was born down in Virginia in 1801. After he married his wife, Ellen Toyer, the couple moved to Alabama, where they operated a store. But the harassment they received in their new home was strong enough that they were compelled to leave the United States for good. By late 1835 or early 1836, the couple were living here in Toronto. Wilson Ruffin Abbott prospered over the years. By the 1870s, he owned 42 houses, five vacant lots, and a couple of warehouses. Wilson Abbott's success is even more incredible when we consider how he wasn't even allowed to learn how to read or write uh, when he was growing up, and he didn't acquire those skills until he got married and his wife, Alan, taught him how. Wilson and Ellen Abbott had four sons and five daughters. Now, one of their sons was Anderson Ruffett Abbott. He was born here in Toronto in 1837. Thanks to his parents' prosperity, Anderson received a good education. He eventually studied medicine at the University of Toronto. Like his parents, Anderson Abbott continued to help Black people he kept on working with different universities and libraries through the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s. Anderson Abbott helped make it uh, possible for young Black students to attend white schools. He wrote all sorts of newspaper articles and worked with all sorts of church groups that helped the Black community in several ways. These few examples that I've given may suggest that Toronto's early Black community was well integrated into the rest of the city's society. And it's true that some of them really were successful and financially prosperous residents of our city. But a census that was conducted in Toronto in 1840 gives us a more complete picture of the situation. The census was commissioned by this man, John Strawn, who is the Anglican Bishop of Toronto. We know that he retained a 29-year-old Black student named Peter Gallego to carry out the survey. Unfortunately, there weren't any photographs uh, in Toronto back in 1840, and we have no illustrations to show us what Peter Gallego actually even looked like. We don't even know why John Strong commissioned the census for Toronto's Black community, but the historical context of the time offers us some, some, some clues. This was just six years after the Slavery Abolition Act that I mentioned earlier came into effect in 1834. This had a strong impact on immigration to Canada. Strawn was also strongly associated with the province's education system, so maybe that was another factor. Although the exact reason for the survey remain a curious mystery, the data, data that Peter Gallego collected is compelling enough in its own right. His records tell us that a neighborhood called St. John's Ward was where many uh, new Black immigrants to Toronto came to live. This neighborhood was often just called the Ward. It was an overcrowded <clears throat> residential area that was centered between Young Street, west to University Avenue, and from Queen Street, north to College Street. Gallego recorded that there were 525 Black residents in Toronto in 1840, which was about 3% of the total population of approximately 17,000 people. And this Black population had a diverse number of occupations as well. It's true that there were successful businessmen and landowners and doctors like Thornton Blackburn or Wilson Ruffin Abbott or his son, the doctor, Anderson Ruffin Abbott, uh, there were also shopkeepers, merchants, skilled tradespeople, but many jobs were controlled by unions or trade associations, 
that prohibited black people from joining. This forced black workers into some of the lowest paid and lowest status jobs. This is a photograph of a mixed black and white uh, road crew working on Jarvis Street. Peter Gallego's census from 1840 tells us how many members of Toronto's black community chose living in the city because they found that working on farms awakened the recollection of pain and humiliation that they still associated with slavery and plantations down in the American South. Toronto had some other problems too. This is a petition from 1841 and it's signed by several members of Toronto's black community. The people who signed it were asking Toronto City Council to ban a company of American actors who were portraying black people in a derogatory or insulting manner uh, while they were performing in a touring minstrel show. It took a few years worth of petitions to get Toronto City Council to listen. Finally, in July of 1843, the municipal government refused to let these troops perform unless actors promised not to, quote, sing songs or perform acts that would be insulting to the gentlemen of color of the city, end of quote. But despite the ban that the city passed in 1843, this kind of entertainment persisted well into the 20th century. The city directories that were published in Toronto in 1846 and 1850 identified some Torontonians as colored, but they didn't racially profile any other Torontonians or identify them by skin color or creed or country of origin. So this is what Toronto was like uh, in the couple of decades before Albert Jackson and his family got here at the end of the 1850s. It could be a tolerant city, certainly, but it wasn't perfect. In the next section of my talk, I'd like to explore some of the obstacles that the Jackson family had to overcome after they arrived here in Toronto. Albert Jackson was born in the city of Milford, down in Delaware, on November the 2nd, 1857. He was one of nine children born to an enslaved woman named Anne Maria Jackson. Albert's father was a freeborn blacksmith named, named John Jackson. Although the Jacksons made enough money for the entire family to live in John Jackson's very modest household, Anne Maria and her nine children remained enslaved. Marriages between freed people and enslaved ones were not uncommon, but it meant that the freedom of the enslaved persons was entirely up to the whim of whoever was legally considered their owner. One day in 1858, when Albert Jackson was still an infant, his two eldest brothers, Richard Jackson and James Jackson, were sold away from their family. Shortly after, their father, John Jackson, ended up here in the local county poorhouse. He had quite literally gone out of his mind with grief. It's true that he had no legal control over the welfare of his own children. He couldn't protect them. But the loss of his children drove him uh, into this institution, and he died there a few weeks later. Shortly after that, Anne Maria Jackson found out that the person who legally owned her and her children, a man named James Brown, intended to sell four more of her children away. They were going to be sold down the river to the brutal cotton plantations of Vicksburg, Mississippi. The notion of losing four more of her children was just too much for her to bear. So in the autumn of 1858, Anne Maria Jackson set out with the seven of her children who were still at home. Albert Jackson was the youngest. Again, he was only about one year old. Anne Marie knew that uh, there were laws that allowed people escaping enslavement to be chased, captured, and then returned to their slave owners. But the only other option was the loss of her family. The Jackson family first arrived at the home of this man, an abolitionist named Thomas Garrett. He lived in Wilmington, Delaware. Over the years, Thomas Garrett was uh, threatened harassed, arrested, and assaulted for his efforts in helping people get away from slavery. 
but it's estimated that he helped more than 2,500 African Americans to escape to freedom. On November the 21st, 1858, Thomas Garrett wrote about the Jackson family escape. He said, we had some trouble in getting the Jacksons safe along, as they could not travel far on foot and could not safely cross any of the bridges on the canal. Garrett talked about how the Jacksons were delayed in the middle of the night because there were spies and bounty hunters everywhere. But by the end of November 1858, the Jacksons had arrived at an underground railway stop in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was operated or organized by this man, William Still. Still helped nearly a thousand people escape to slavery, but we still have the impressions that he's left to us concerning Anne Maria Jackson. He wrote, Many times in going out to a day's work, she would be compelled to leave her children, not knowing whether during her absence they would fall victims to fire or be carried off by their master. William still cited Anne Maria ja Jackson's religious faith when discussing her remarkable strength and courage. He observed, the fire of freedom obviously burned with no ordinary fervor in the breast of the slave mother. Anne Maria Jackson left Philadelphia and traveled along a network of underground railway stops through Pennsylvania and New York State. Near the end of 1858, the family crossed the international border into Canada West, what is now the province of Ontario, and they stopped in St. Catharines. After a brief stopover, the Jackson family went were sent east to Toronto, where they could would eventually settle and live out their lives. The 1850s were coming to a close. Toronto was booming in commerce and economics and in industry and in population. But what kinds of opportunity would it offer to the Jackson family? Let's explore that in the next section of my talk. Once they were here in Toronto, the Jackson family faced the daunting process of starting their lives all over again. They were no longer enslaved, but they still faced at least some intolerance, uncertainty, and economic hardship. Living the life of a refugee was every bit as difficult back at the end of the 1850s as it is today. This is the only illustration I've ever found of Anne Maria Jackson and the seven children that she originally escaped to Toronto with. It was first published on April the 2nd, 1874, so about 15 years after the escape. It appeared in several abolitionist periodicals and Christian magazines, and even in the New York Daily Tribune. But it also gives us a hint to the welcome that the Jacksons would have received here in Toronto. For starters, they were a little bit like local celebrities, at least for a while. Despite the fact that there was definitely discrimination, some people who lived here in the late 1850s and early 1860s prided themselves on how tolerant Toronto could be. A lot of people here in Toronto seemed to support the abolitionist movement, at least outwardly. Just one example of the support took place here at a building called St. Lawrence Hall, it was built in 1850 at the southwest corner of King and Jarvis Streets, and it's still standing there today. It was originally opened as a venue for concerts, lectures, and rallies. It soon became just about the greatest public hall in Toronto. But one of the very first people to speak at St. Lawrence Hall was Frederick Douglass, the noted American abolitionist and author who had escaped from enslavement. He came to Toronto in September of 1851, as part of a gathering of hundreds of Canadian, American, and British delegates who were working to end American slavery. The abolitionist convention that was held in Toronto in 1851 was a pretty big deal. A man named George Brown attended the convention at St. Lawrence Hall too. He was born in Scotland in 1818 and moved to Toronto in 1843 
1844, George Brown started the Globe newspaper, which would eventually become part of the Globe and Mail newspaper that we know today. George Brown was a passionate abolitionist who lived right here in Toronto and supported opening up Canadian colonies to those refugees who were coming here to escape slavery. He often penned and published abolitionist articles in the pages of his newspaper. So there at least uh, was some sense of acceptance and hope for the Jacksons when they arrived here in Toronto. They had escaped enslavement. They were free, but they needed an income. They needed a home. They were free, but their prospects of being free to starve out in the cold didn't seem all that appealing. Thankfully, the Jacksons were immediately taken in by Thornton and Lucy Blackburn. Now, I showed this plaque a little bit earlier in my talk. It uh, speaks about the Blackburn's contribution to our city. By the time the Jacksons arrived in Toronto, the Blackburns had spent nearly 25 years becoming prominent members in Toronto's Black community. The Blackburns plaque is right next to Inglenook Community School, which I've shown here. The school's been there since 1887, but before that, the Blackburns built their small, one-story, wooden frame house here. It would have made for even tighter accommodation once the Jacksons moved in, but at least there was a roof over the head and a yard outside for the children to play. The Jacksons only stayed in the Blackburns' home for a short while. But the Blackburns also owned six other properties in St. John's Ward, which they rented out to new Black immigrants. The Jacksons moved into one of these at 88 Edward Street. This address puts the house just one block north of Dundas Street West and just west of Bay Street. And I've tried to mark uh, 88 Edward Street on uh, this map uh, of Toronto from 1858. The Blackburns were more than just landlords. They helped Anna Maria Jackson find a job, get clothes and food, and all the other necessities for her family. The two families may have only shared the same house for a few weeks, but even after the Jacksons moved into the house on Edward Street, there's every indication that the two families enjoyed a long, close friendship in the years to come. The Jacksons also had help from other sources. This building used to be a charitable institution called the House of Industry. The building is still there today, although these days it's used by the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association. It's located at 87 Elm Street at Elizabeth Street, so immediately south of where the Hospital for Sick Children is today, and a little more than a block west of where uh, Anne Maria Jackson and her children lived on Edward Street. The House of Industry was also known as the Poor House or the Workhouse. This is where the most destitute residents of Toronto came to live. Uh, they were uh, fed and lodged here in exchange for doing chores. As Toronto's population grew, so did the House of Industry. There, was, uh, there were always people in need of shelter. But the House of Industry also provided social services to the local community long before they were available from the government. Anne Maria Jackson came here for food to feed her children and wood to burn to keep them warm until she found steady employment. The first entry in the House of Industry's records for Anne Maria Jackson said she was five weeks out of slavery. Anne Maria Jackson went back to the House of Industry for supplies during the next winter, at the end of 1859 and the start of 1860. But the charitable records also tell us that Anne Maria Jackson was very industrious, and she spent the rest of her life independently supporting her family. By 1871, the Jackson family were living at 93 Elizabeth Street. This was one block west of Bay Street, uh, and a little south of Dundas Street. So right behind where Toronto's current City Hall is uh, today. Anne Maria Jackson took in other people's laundry in order to make enough money to feed her children and send them to school. Everything had to be washed by hand. It was all put through a wringer uh, 
scrubbed against a board, squeezed through a mangler, or hung up to dry. It was exhausting work, lifting heavy, wet clothes, pounding and wringing them out, then ironing them out and putting up all these sheets and tablecloths on lines. This could be done outside when it was nice, but inside when the weather was cold and damp. Anne Maria took on heavy labor here in Toronto, but she found her freedom. There was joy, too. Her two eldest children, Richard and James Jackson, both escaped from slavery down in the United States. They both got word that the rest of their surviving family had relocated to Toronto. The family was reunited here in the city by the early 1860s. Anne Maria Jackson worked hard her whole life and was taking in lingerie right up until she turned 69 years old in 1879. She died the next year on January the 28th, 1880, at the age of 70 years old, uh, after a life of enslavement and escape, anxiety and hard work and poverty, but also a life of hope and love and even joy. She died and was laid to rest in the family burial plot that Thornton and Lucy Blackburn owned a tall stone obelisk marks the place where Thornton and Lucy are buried. But Anne Maria Jackson is laid to rest much more modestly and discreetly in the grounds of the Blackburn's internment space. But despite this lack of commemoration, I felt that it was fitting to talk about her life full of courage and hard work and hope during my presentation today. Now, I really wanted to highlight Anne Maria Jackson's life story. She was a single mother who ended up living with all nine of her children here in Toronto. She worked hard to support them all the rest of her life, but I've also promised to tell you a little bit more about the rest of her family. The Jackson children mostly worked as barbers, a waiter, a laundress, and other similar professions. But so far as I've been able to determine, we really only know any detail about two of her children. These were Richard Jackson and his brother, Albert Jackson, who I originally planned to uh, make uh, the subject of most of my talk today. Richard Jackson was one of the sons who had been sold away from his family, but then later escaped and was reunited uh, with his family here in Toronto. He worked as a barber and eventually built up a clientele that included several wealthy and prominent people across Toronto. Richard Jackson was a popular figure whose clientele transcended all kinds of social and racial boundaries across the city. But Richard Jackson died unexpectedly young in the spring of 1885. He was only 38 years old. His funeral was held here at the British Methodist Episcopal Church at 94 Chestnut Street in St. John's Ward. A newspaper called The Toronto World was published between 1880 and 1921. On June the 3rd, 1885, it ran an obituary of Richard Jackson that said that a thousand people were at the funeral, including aldermen and military officers, former mayors of the city, and a host of the town's notables who had all frequented his shop. Richard Jackson was laid to rest near his mother in the burial plot that Thornton and Lucy Blackburn owned. His funeral procession of more than 50 carriages and hundreds of pedestrians wound its way through the city streets from the British Methodist Episcopal Church eastward towards the Necropolis Cemetery. In 2007, an author named Carolyn Smarts Frost published a book about the Blackburns called I've Got a Home in Gloryland but she also mentions Robert Jackson in her book. She describes his funeral as a remarkable tribute to a man whose value to the community clearly transcended any divisions of race or class that existed in the highly stratified late 19th century city. It's true that when we look at how broadly Richard Jackson was mourned, it does suggest how much is this refugee, this asylum seeker, was accepted into Toronto society and then prospered. 
At last, this brings us to a biography of Albert Jackson. He was only about a year old when the family crossed to freedom in Canada. He must have had barely any memories of his life down in the United States. And we've already explored what his life would have been like as he grew up here in Toronto. Thanks to his mother's hard work, Albert Jackson was able to go to school and get a, at least a basic education. Then on May the 12th, 1882, Jackson was hired by the federal postal system. He was 24 years old, and he was the first black letter carrier employed by the Royal Mail in Canada. On his very first day on the job, Albert Jackson's colleagues refused to train him to deliver mail. A supervisor assigned him to a lower position as a hall porter, basically a caretaker. This discriminatory reaction was based on the color of Albert Jackson's skin. His fellow mail carriers wouldn't treat him as an equal because he was black. We can compare this to his older brother Richard's success as a barber. Albert Jackson faced resistance and opposition and discrimination when he chose to be a mail carrier. But by most accounts, Richard Jackson was well received in his chosen profession. As we've heard, Richard Jackson's successful trans success transcended racial and social barriers all across Toronto. This was probably due, at least in part, to the fact that Richard Jackson became a barber. This became a very stereotypical job for black men. We've already heard how many black men were often forced into lower paying jobs like laborers. Becoming a barber was another option. They were, there were very few job opportunities open to black men, despite however well-educated they may have been. There were exceptions, of course. We've heard about how Wilson Ruff and Abbott moved to Toronto in the 1830s and became a relatively wealthy and prolific landowner. We've also heard how he sent his son, Anderson Ruff and Abbott, to university to become Toronto's very first black doctor. But the fact that these stories are the exception may be one of the reasons we hear about them so much during times of the year, like uh, during February, during Black History Month. By only favoring the story of any community's biggest success stories by the prominent or wealthy individuals who made a very small part of it up, it's easier to accept or even ignore the negative things that happened to the rest of that community. Thornton Blackburn was successful too, thanks in part to the taxi cab company that he opened in Toronto in 1837. He won the acceptance and respect of a lot of people across Toronto. But there was one subtle difference. On some level, operating a taxi was considered a subservient kind of work. There was a prevailing attitude, at least for some, that blacks were socially inferior to whites and were meant to work in menial or subordinate vocations. This attitude was another historical stereotype that was often articulated towards uh, sleeping car porters on Canadian railways all through the 1800s and well into the 1900s. The vast majority of these were black men who had to wait on the every whim of the railway car passengers. The hours were terrible, job security was almost non-existent, the pay was low and salary increases were rare. Tips were absolutely necessary to supplement the income of any railway porter or, for that matter, a barber or taxi driver or waiter. And this dependence often put black men in a precarious and even servile position. So it was more socially acceptable for Richard Jackson to become a barber, but Albert Jackson was blocked from becoming a postal carrier at least at first. Their story was soon picked up by the press. On May 17th, 1882, just five days after Albert Jackson was hired, the Evening Telegram newspaper ran an extremely racist article with the headline, The Objectionable African. In the article, Albert Jackson was described as an, an obnoxious colored man whose hiring as a letter carrier had brought on the intense disgust of the existing post office staff. Days later, another editorial offered a counterpoint. It argued that objections to the young man on account of his color are indefensible. 
Taxes are not made a penny less to a man because he happens to have dark skin. The argument was plain. Albert Jackson was contributing to society. Let him work. On May the 29th, 1882, several members of the Jackson family met with other leaders of Toronto's Black community here at the Richmond Street Methodist Church. The church was located near the heart of St. John's Ward on the south side of Richmond Street between Young and Bay Streets. They rallied and set up a committee to protest how Albert Jackson had been treated. This is George Washington Smith. He was another Toronto entrepreneur and a barber, but he was also a leading spokesperson for his community. When, he, when this committee was formed, he published a letter to the editors of various Toronto newspapers explaining that Black people were as capable as anybody else and should be extended the very same opportunities. On May 30th, 1882, George Washington Smith led his committee of five Black Torontonians into a meeting with Prime Minister Sir John A. Macdonald. Macdonald instructed the postmaster to reinstate Albert Jackson and have him uh, trained on how to deliver mail. Sir John A. Macdonald's decision was indeed the morally correct thing to do, but it was also motivated by politics. Of course, a federal election was less uh, than a month away, and Macdonald was eager to gain the support of Black voters, both in Toronto and across Canada, but at least the end result was a positive one. Three days after the meeting with Sir John A. Macdonald, Albert Jackson was given his job back and went to work as a postal carrier. This picture of Toronto's letter carriers was taken shortly after Jackson was allowed to go back to work. He's standing in the fifth row and is the eighth man in from the left. After a brief mention in the Globe newspaper that he returned to work with no objection being raised, Albert Jackson's story vanished from the newspaper headlines. He settled into his job. He delivered mail along a route through Toronto's Harvard Village neighborhood, which is south of Bloor Street between Spadina Avenue and Bathurst Street. Albert Jackson married Henrietta Jones on March the 3rd, 1883, so nearly one a year after he fought his way into the Postal Service. They had four sons, and this is a picture of them all together. Alfred, Richard, Harold, and Bruce. They lived in a home on Chestnut Street near the British Methodist Episcopal Church that I mentioned earlier. Albert Jackson became heavily involved in the church community. Albert Jackson spent most of his professional career working out of here, the General Post Office building on Adelaide Street at the top of Toronto Street. It was built in the magnificent, magnificently elegant Second Empire style of architecture all the way back in 1872. The post office was designed by a noted Toronto architect named Henry Langley. As a postman, Jackson likely earned a decent salary. In 1902, the minimum wage for a letter carrier was $1.25 per day. By 1913, it was up to $3 per day. Albert Jackson's salary allowed him to buy a few more uh, homes in the Toronto area, which he then rented out for extra income. In doing so, he fulfilled the hope that we can all probably relate to. We work to overcome whatever physical or economical or emotional or societal adversity the generation before us might have gone through and in turn we hopefully leave behind a better set of circumstances for the generation that comes after us. Albert Jackson's mother Anne Maria Jackson had quite literally risked her own life and the lives of her children to escape enslavement. Albert Jackson's sons were born and grew up uh, in a world of freedom. Albert Jackson worked as a letter carrier for almost 36 years, from the time that the Canadian Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, ordered that his co-workers had to train him in June of 1882, right up until his death on January the 14th, 1918. He was 60 years old at the time of his passing. Albert Jackson is buried in the Acropolis Cemetery. Unlike Thornton and Lucy Blackburn, who are laid to rest in the same cemetery, Albert Jackson's gravesite is marked 
by a relatively modest stone, and I've shown a picture of it here. His wife, Henrietta, is buried beside him. Henrietta lived for another 40 years as a widow before passing away on September the 3rd, 1958. She was 99 years old at the time of her death. I thought I'd wrap up my presentation today by talking a little bit more about Albert Jackson's legacy before concluding with one final thought on some of the history that I presented today. While Albert Jackson's story was known by members of his own family for, for generations, it wasn't until Carolyn Smart's Frost uh, published her, her book, I've Got a Home in Glory Land, in 2007, that the story reached a wider audience. Now, I mentioned how the book details the lives of Thornton and Lucy Blackburn, but it also re retold Albert Jackson's story, too. Earlier, I mentioned how Albert Jackson spent years walking through the Toronto neighbourhood of Harvard Village on his postal delivery route. In 2013, a laneway in Harvard Village was named uh, in his honour. Jackson family December descendants gathered from all over Canada and the United States to mark the naming of Albert Jackson Lane, which is located just east of Harvard Street between Brunswick Avenue and uh, Borden Street. The General Post Office, where Albert Jackson worked, was rather brut brutally demolished in 1958, but in 2017, an historical plaque was placed on the site. This plaque tells the story of Albert Jackson and his fight to work as a postal carrier. The plaque also mentions Anne Maria Jackson and her uh, flight from enslavement on the Freedom Trail, and the plaque even shows a picture of the General Post Office building uh, at the lower right. Some of Albert Jackson's descendants, including two of his great-grandchildren, attended the plaque unveiling in 2017. Members of the Ontario Black History Society and other representatives of the Black community were also on hand. In February of 2019, Canada Post issued a special stamp depicting Albert Jackson the Stamps illustrator, uh, Ron uh, Dolacamp, said that recreating Jackson's look was the biggest challenge. He said, I wanted to show him performing his duty with a slight smile and a spring in his step as if he has just stepped out of history to hand you your mail. And last year, in 2023, Canada Post officially opened the Albert Jackson Processing Centre in Northern Scarborough. It's the largest mail sorting facility in Canada. The new $470 million uh, facility is located at 1395 Tapscott Road near Markham Road and Steeles Avenue East. This processing centre can sort 1 million packages every day when it's working at full capacity. So in recent years, Albert Jackson's story has become better known, thanks in part to these tributes that have helped to commemorate him. But I feel as though the broader story of a few of his family members is still waiting to be better discovered. And I hope that you found, uh, found this presentation enlightening. But I'd like to end with uh, one final thought. Booker T. Washington was an American teacher, author, and Black community leader. He lived down in the United States at the same time that Albert Jackson was living and working here in Toronto. Booker uh, Washington once said, A lie doesn't become truth, wrong doesn't become right, and evil doesn't become good, just because it's accepted by a majority. I've decided to end with this quote in response to the belief that I sometimes hear that history happened the way that it did, because that's just the way the things used to be. I take this to mean that things like racial discrimination or sexism or slavery or any number of moral wrongs uh, were all just taken for granted by everyone universally in the past. There's nothing we can do about it. That's just the way that things used to be. Well, the more I think about it, the more I disagree with this line of thinking. History is full of people who faced sometimes violent oppression uh, 
because of their skin color or their gender or their religion or their background. Some of them, no doubt, felt powerless uh, to do anything about it. But some people have fought back against these sorts of repression, sometimes just as violently. What I hope I've demonstrated today is that there were plenty of people who absolutely knew these things were going uh, were wrong, and they tried to do something of, uh, to fix them while they were still going on. The people that I've talked about today mostly lived between 100 and 150 years ago. But all through history, there have been people who fought against the way things used to be. Thankfully, we have the positive examples that were set by Albert Jackson and his mother, Anne Maria Jackson, and the other characters that I've introduced today. They struggled to free themselves from enslavement, from racism, and all the while they worked for a better life. But in the meantime, they made a better city for the rest of us too. This concludes my presentation for today. Please let me know if you have uh, any questions, comments, or observations in the uh, comments section uh, here on YouTube down below. Uh, you can also email me, Richard at MuddyYorkTours.com, or contact me, contact me over my social media links, which are repeated below. Uh, and um, you can follow me on Instagram, which is hundreds of photographs of Toronto's history. Uh, or again, just leave your comments here on YouTube. Uh, thanks again for watching, and I hope that you've enjoyed my presentation today.